Welcome to the Dining for One Health and Wellness Show, where we inspire and encourage you to embrace a life of health and wellness and to learn how to exploit the benefits of living a healthy lifestyle. I am your host, Carlos Cruz, and I'd like to thank you for listening to our show. Folks, are you aware there are many paths to spiritual and personal growth? If you have been waiting to discover your path uh, and your truth, do we have a guest for you? Our guests can help you learn how to embrace the beauty, strength, and the power within yourself. Do you have control of your negative talk? I know a lot of you do not, and it just consumes you. Are you aware how you can transform your life through the power of forgiveness? I know it sounds a little bit off for those who are not familiar with this, but forgiveness, even though as corny as it may sound, it is very powerful to use once you know how to properly utilize it. Our guest is Nita Lipinski. She has been working as a clairvoyant medium for over three decades and offers uh, meditation classes and workshops on forgiveness, releasing judgment, and finding one's intuition. She is a certified hypnotherapist and has studied integrative uh, breath and bioenergy. Both are modalities of healing emotional issues uh, using breathing and moving energy. Nita is currently working on her book, Five Behaviors That Heal, which should be out later this year. Nita, welcome to the show. We are happy to have you on. I am delighted to be here. Thank you so much for having me. It is our pleasure to have someone like you on. So how have things been going? What have you been up to lately? Anything, any new projects on the horizon? Well, the the book I'm working on is new. And uh, if all the stars line up right and everything's perfect, then it will be done this year. But <laughs> that may not happen. <laughs> but yes, working on that. And I do have several uh, classes and workshops happening also. What kind of classes and workshops do you have going on? I have, uh, I have classes for the development of learning, how, learning some practical exercises so that you can uh, identify your intuition and how it manifests for you because it's different for everybody. And so I have a class on how to do that and how to recognize um, your body's energy and the energy outside of you and how to identify those in, in practical terms that people can feel and uh, see and touch and experience. So I have those happening. I have a presentation actually on um, the five behaviors that heal and their counter behaviors that don't uh, coming up this week as well. Is that link on your website? It is. And what, what is it? Is it an online course or a teleseminar, a Google Plus Hangout? Um, actually, that is going to be a free um, presentation that, I, that I'm offering. I am going to offer a teleclass on the book and the same topic. I just haven't scheduled it yet. I simply haven't had time. But my intention is to do a teleclass, a free one, uh, sometime in October. Okay, we'll make sure we'll have the link uh, to that on the show notes. Uh, before we, we really get into the gist of things, can you explain a little bit what it means to be a natural clairvoyant and a medium? Is it something that you're born with, or is it something you can develop? Uh, and even if you are born with it, is it something you have to constantly train, like a muscle, in order to become more proficient in it? Um, yes, yes, and yes. Uh, I was born with it. I think that people can learn to develop it. I think everybody has um, the gifts, one of the gifts of the Claire's or all of the gifts. And it is no different than being born a natural athlete or a natural musician or singer. So you have natural ability, but in order to master your craft and be better and learn and understand it, you have to practice, practice, practice. And, you know, for something like clairvoyance where you're dealing with other people and, you know, their personal information and energy, you want to make sure that you are living the life um, that you are suggesting they live. That's perhaps that's not well said. 
not living the life that you want them to live, but that you are clear and living a life that allows you to continue your clarity so that you're not sort of a false prophet. Right. So, it does make a lot of sense. And the reason why I asked you is because I, we know that you're an accomplished author, and you've also written a book called The Knowing Awake in the Dark. And it reads like a suspense thriller. So while I was breezing through it, I was curious if this is a fiction novel or is this basically based on true events? Because I found the, the connecting paths of where the book goes and what you do in real life uh, pretty interesting. Yes, it's absolutely true. Uh, it's not just based on a true story. It's, it is uh, all true. I went to great lengths to uh, make sure all of, all of the truths were followed. I did change the names because um, there are a lot of other victims uh, in the book. So there's, and it is written like a suspense novel because I wanted the reader to experience um, what I'm writing about in the same way I did. So I bring them through it with me, the way that I learned and experienced the whole thing. And for those who are not aware, Nita's talking about the, the sweetheart rapist, which, uh, who terrorized and raped more than a dozen women in Northern California back in the 1980s, and you have a direct connection uh, with this person, correct? Yes, yes. And so the story is told, it intertwines both the lives of the sweetheart rapist from the age of seven and my, and my life from the age of seven and how they intertwined and eventually collided and what happened. So we can find this on Amazon, right? You can find it on Amazon, yes. All right, we'll also have the link to that on the show notes as well. So let's talk about the place that you're at now in your life. What would you say uh, are the main, some of the main life experiences you can identify which placed you on the path to where you, you ended up? Well, I think like everybody, I mean, all people have different levels of struggle and trauma in their life. And I think you, at some point you have to decide what's going to define you, the events in your life or what you're going to do with them. And so what I do today is help people find their path of healing and how they can lead function, functioning, healthy, happy lives. You know, I tell people all the time that a, you know, traumatic past does not condemn you to a dysfunctional future. It's, it's everybody can heal. And that is kind of where I'm at now in my life is trying to help people find out what is the best best path for them to heal. So let's talk about how this ties into your mind, body, and spirit approach. What is the pathway you use when trying to bring them together to help your clients? Well, you know, I remember back in 1992, uh, the Olympics, there was a, a young Olympist, her name was Carrie Strug. Remember her? Uh, no, I, I wasn't was in the States the, back then. Okay, she was on the women's gymnastic team. She was, she was, I think, just, she was the youngest gymnast. She was 14 years old. And uh, the, the games had come down to an event. She had pole vaulted and broke her ankle on her dismount, and it wasn't perfect. And it was literally between the Russian team and the American team. And this girl, this 14-year-old girl, got it in her mind that she was going to do the, it was the pummel horse. She was going to, going to run down and do the pummel horse again so that her team would not lose, so that they would win the Olympics. And with a broken ankle, she ran, did the pummel horse, dismounted, held her dismount and won. And it was, you know, one of those astounding moments that anybody who saw it will never forget. And what I'll say about that is that the mind and what we believe and what we think is very, very powerful. It can change everything. It can take over the body. And so when we, when you talk about mind, body, and spirit, 
you know, obviously you want to keep a healthy body because the healthier your body is, the better you feel. Your spirit, a lot of people, you know, it doesn't matter how you feed the spirit, whether it is that you attend church and community and help others and feel connected with your source, whatever that might be, or if you're on a spiritual path, if you're a Buddhist or, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what you practice as long as you feed that spiritual consciousness and your mind, you know, what is it you're thinking? What kind of thoughts do you have every day? Are you, you know, in your car and judgment and screaming at people and in a commute and just angry and, you know, or are you able to get a hold of your mind and, and control your thought process? And so the balance of those three things are very important and very powerful in our life. And so I teach meditation, uh, I think for spirit and for mind, really. And I teach people to, that your brain, you know, your mind doesn't think independently of you. So when you th talk about negative self-talk, for instance, I've had many clients say, you know, my mind starts thinking these things and I can't stop it. But the truth is you can't because your brain is not an independent uh, thing from you. You are in control of your brain. And you just have to learn that you are and learn how to change it and shift that consciousness. So people try to uh, divide themselves between their mind and their brain. Is that correct? Is that how they do it, the excuse that they use? Um, I, I'm not sure I, I follow that. Well, when, when people say that, you know, the voices in my head or my brain is thinking this, but my mind is thinking this, is that the mind being the, the subconscious and the brain being them themselves. Have you had any experience with people dividing uh, the correlation between the two? Not so much. I think people feel uh, that they can feel helpless to their own thought process. So there are two ways in which that manifests in, in clients that I deal with. One is people who engage in anxiety which is projecting negative thoughts about future events which have not occurred, right? right. So it's a fear-based energy, and, and sometimes those thoughts, they feel that they can just take on a life of their own, that their mind is thinking all these things and their body is responding to those thoughts. So when they begin to go into anxiety, their heart rate increases, you know, their palms might get wet, they feel sick to their stomach, they get very fearful, and so their body, their physical body is responding to their mental thoughts, and they feel helpless to control those thoughts. And, of course, that's not true. That's just a habitual pattern, and they have to learn how to get a hold of that. And the same thing can happen with negative thinking or negative self-talk. So we don't really pay attention always to these negative loops that we have running in our mind, you know, I'm not smart enough, or what an idiot I am, or, you know, oh, look at me, I, I look horrible, I'm fat, I'm ugly, I'm, you know, unattractive, and we're thinking these things, and they impact our physical well-being, and our emotional well-being. So let's take that and add on to this, the experiences, because some can argue, and I don't know what your philosophy is on this, but some say that the sum of our experiences basically is what we become. Uh, how do you use experiences to help people overcome the obstacles in their lives? What are some of the main points you keep in mind when supporting someone? Well, you know, for me, so if, 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 if that were true, if that statement were true for me, I am the sum of my experiences, then I might, you know, not be somebody helping others to heal because I had a very dysfunctional life. I was a battered child. I was raped. I was molested. I, you know, I, I was a um, heavy drug user in my very, you know, for a period of time in my life. I had 
you know, there weren't a lot of positive experiences. And at some point in my life, I decided, who are, who are you going to be, right? I mean, who are you going to be? Are you going to be a victim of these events for the rest of your life and be fearful and angry and stuck? Or are you going to use these things to grow and learn and be full and let go of those things that don't serve you, like anger and judgment and blame? Because there is no place for those, no room for them. They will just keep you stuck in negative, hurtful patterning. That's what I tell people. When you're ready, you know, when you're tired of carrying all that hatred and anger and fear, then it's time to surrender it and forgive and let go and do that one step at a time and decide who are you going to be? You know, who are you going to be? So this, how does this tie into your mind, body, and spirit approach? What is the, the pathway that you use when trying to bring them together to help your clients? Well, it depends on the client. So some people, I, I teach meditation as a way of being, even if it's only five minutes every morning uh, to meditate and use a conscious intention. So let's say I have a client who finds that they are very judgmental, and in their judgment, they are splintering relationships in their family because they think others should be making choices that they believe is good or right. Okay? So uh, perhaps I'm going to start that person with uh, a conscious intention every day where they kind of drop into their heart, which is the seat of authentic self, and to affirm their goal that day is to release judgment. I release judgment. And to... Each time they have judgmental thought that day, they just release it. Let it, you know, fly like a flock of birds out of their chest. And maybe that's their one focus for a week until they can identify how much they judge and how differently they feel when they're judging, how it locks their energy up, how they feel angry, how they're, you know, until they can identify themselves, how it's affecting them. And once you get somebody to wake up into a consciousness of the, what experience they are creating, now you have room to begin to work with them on what steps they're going to take to forgive and to shift their own awareness and how their thoughts or their judgment or whatever their particular thing is in a way that is positive rather than negative. Does that make sense? Yes, that makes a lot of sense. And how have you seen your clients change in a way where they're able to help themselves improve their well-being and enhance their healing abilities? Can you give us a little insight as to what they went through? Yes. I have a client and a friend of mine who years ago, and this is, you know, probably 15 or so years ago, she, her husband left her, had an affair, and left her for another woman, and she was very angry and fearful. She had identical twin girls, and they were about five years old, and she was terrified that she was not going to be able to do it alone and go forward, and she was so wrought with anxiety. Uh, she would call me at 2 and 3 in the morning hysterical and shaking and out of control because she would just plunge into this anxiety to a point that she was couldn't get a hold of herself. She was physically sick. Now, 15 years, <laughs> she was unable to forgive. She felt herself a victim for 15 years of her ex-husband, all right? She was angry because he cheated on her. He lied to her. He left her. So she was a victim of him. And because she was a victim, there were many things in her life which she felt victimized by as a result of, all right? So they were all sort of linked together. And until she was literally, uh, literally and 
effectively on her knees until that could just no longer work for her. She was so tired of being angry and being a victim and being negative and being afraid that, you know, in the next moment the shoe was going to drop her, her life was going to explode, that she finally decided, okay, I am, I am willing to change. I'm willing to stop being a victim. And so she took, she kind of started a step at a time. Today, I release anger. I forgive. I realize that, you know, this event in my life had purpose. So what is the gift? What what is the gift that I have never picked up? And how can I get my gift and let the rest go and forgive and move on? So you know, that was one person. And today she's very healthy and has forgiven and surrender, forgiven her father, forgiven her ex-husband. She is no longer a victim. She is a very strong, articulate, uh, beautiful woman who, you know, uh, doesn't even resemble that person that she used to be in fear all those years ago. And I'd like to emphasize to the audience, and correct me if I'm wrong, that this didn't happen overnight. This took many, many small steps and worked themselves into larger steps until she can be able to get to the point where she is now. Is that correct? Well, you know what it took? Yes, but not, it didn't take her 15 years. Right. She spent, you know, she spent 12 of those years continuing to have the same experience of fear and anger and rage over and over and over and victimization. And the, the first step is in deciding that you're ready to change. Which and is the biggest you, step. Yes. And once you've decided that, then you can uncover and forgive. And yes, it is small steps, but you know, it's amazing progress. You, you'll be amazed at how quickly you move and shed and awaken and become self-aware. And as you said before, the, the biggest point there is that you have to want to make that decision. If you don't, then yes. nothing's going to happen. Correct. I mean, you know, and some people live their whole lives like that, and that's their path. Perhaps, you know, perhaps for them, that's, that's where they want to be. But if you don't want to be there, then you need to make the decision not to be there and go forward and trust that the universe or life or God or whatever you want to call it for you is going to show you and give you um, openings and ways that, you know, what you need is going to be revealed to you. I guess those that are not able to get hold of you or attend one of your seminars or meditation classes, they're going to have to go out and buy your, your new book that you're coming out with, The Five Behaviors That Heal, correct? Well, yes, that that will be, those are uh, about very common behaviors. So the five behaviors are the behaviors that heal and they're counter behaviors that don't. And so the book is about how the counter behaviors, which are, you know, habitual gossip, habitual control issues, anxiety, negative self-talk, right? Um... How these things, uh, I'm sure I've forgotten one. Um, how they can we go out engage, and get the book. Yes, they can go out and, when I when I have it published. Right. Yeah. And what was the inspiration behind this book? Years of working with clients and finding that these behaviors are behaviors that are socially acceptable, right? And that people... I mean, we we talk about habitual patterning. We think about people that overdrink, overeat, smoke, you know, gamble, have addictions, you know, drugs, alcohol. And those are overt behaviors and obvious habitual behaviors that we know people who are involved or in the throes of those are in pain, right? We all know that. But these these counter behaviors that I talk about have the same outcomes. So if a person is a habitual gossip, for instance, 
they get their empowerment and their currency is through the information they glean about others that they can spread around. And unfortunately, what happens with that is that it creates a false sense of self. And a false sense of self, you know, leads to a false identity and a false empowerment. And so there's a constant needing to fill, to constantly refill the coffers, right? You've always got to go back and and have the latest information because your peers, your chosen peers, they they expect you to know and expect you to have that. That's your currency. Well, that's that behavior is connected to feeling powerless in your life. So you don't have any power in your life. You don't know how to find that within yourself. So you're looking outside of yourself to get your power. And gossiping is the way that you get it. And gossiping is a fear-based energy. And it's just as destructive and empty and low self-esteem as any of the other more overt habitual behaviors we were talking about. And so these five behaviors or counter behaviors, if you will, are things that are just as damaging, but socially acceptable, but have the same negative outcomes. So you basically can use this book or the main points from this book to help uh, yourself create a healthier life or at least follow, start to follow a healthier lifestyle. So you're basically creating a writing, you're basically writing a book about empowerment, the self-empowerment. You're giving your reader the ability to empower themselves with the knowledge that you're sharing in order for them to make some major changes in their life, which is very hard for some, especially those that are not aware uh, that they need to, to change. So how does this relate to what you do with your clients? Um, well, you know, I do with my clients, you know, obviously I have two, two different kinds of clients. I have clients that come to me for readings, and then I have clients who come to workshops and do practical things. So I think it crosses over because they're very um, common. You know, they all have common links. And even let's say that you are, let's say that you don't have a problem gossiping. But someone you love very much does, and you're closely connected to that, and you don't understand why this person has to do this all the time. And as a result, you have judgment about them, and you get angry, and you think that you you judge them to be, you know, stupid or bad or whatever, right? Um, Hopefully, with this book, you're going to understand, A, what drives them to in their behavior so that you can have some compassion and you don't have to be in a place of judgment because that's another habitual behavior. (laughs) So, you know, really these five counter behaviors touch, I think everybody at some point, they're all intertwined. So what are some ways you believe people can empower themselves today, especially with all the distractions that we have and how easy it is to become part of the herd and people feel that it's a little bit harder for them to, to really be an individual and retake control of their life. Well, I think just to take a few minutes and do what I call sitting in the seat of authentic self. So dropping into your, that spiritual heart, that place just between just at your chest, right in the middle, in the center of your chest. And just to sit with that and breathe in your own something, take something that you know you're good at and breathe that in and let it expand all throughout your body and just focus on that thing that you're good at and allow that compassion and that love and that self-worth and that feeling, that good feeling about yourself to emanate and give that outward. And you, you then have more compassion, not only for yourself, but for other people. And it's very empowering. A, a behavior that can be very empowering is to lift others up. So what I mean by that is just, you know, I would say to people, I dare you to at least twice a day, whether it's somebody in the elevator or somebody you're passing in the grocery store, 
find something you can say to them, oh, my goodness, that color is beautiful on you, or your laughter just made my day, or your child is so lovely. Find a way to pick them up and make them feel good and give them a genuine compliment, and you will receive that twofold, and you will feel wonderful. And that doesn't sound like anything hard or difficult to do. No. You also have the pleasure of living and working in Arizona, unlike many people who live in the Northeast. I live in California, so I really don't have to worry about that. Uh, We know the weather there is beautiful majority of the year, so it makes it a perfect place to hold workshops and seminars. And we just touched a little bit about it in the beginning of the show, but can you go into a little bit more detail at some of the workshops that you hold in Arizona? Uh, yes, let me, let me just, let me just pull up my, um, uh, if you go to my, if you visit my website, neetolipinski.com under events, I have, I try to post, you know, everything that I do each month and then a few months ahead. So again, every once a month, I always hold what I call a group reading. And people can, it's $20, you have to RSVP, so I keep, I try to keep it to an amount that people can afford, right? They come in and everybody that shows up uh, gets to ask at least a few questions as you would in a reading. And so I do that every month. Um, And, you know, it's always on a Friday evening and that changes each month when it falls. So I always do that. I try to do a group open forum event where I talk about how your intuition manifests, how you can identify identify it, what exercises you can do to strengthen it. And that changes with the group because different people have different needs or notice different ways they're their uh, intuition can come and some have questions about it. So with each group, I may design a particular group exercise or individual exercises. And again, we work on energy and how it shifts and patterns and how you can hold it and feel it and manipulate it to your benefit, right? And that's also $20. And so I also teach beginning meditation, and it's a five-week course, and it is uh, just beginning meditations that one builds on on the next. You learn six different meditations so that hopefully you will resonate with at least one. And then once a month, I try to do a workshop on forgiveness or releasing or surrender. It just depends on how I feel and how the groups have been that are coming through and what I feel people need or what they ask me uh, or tell me they would like to learn. Yeah, I'm looking at your events page right now on your website. I'm seeing the October 7th being the beginning meditation class. And you said that's five weeks long. What? Yes. For for somebody who's constantly on the go, um, how would they benefit from this? Well, you know, meditation is a time that you connect with your highest source, whatever that might be. And there is power in that. I mean, the Catholics have been teaching it for centuries, right? They, they teach you, they give you... Um, I don't know what they're called because I'm not Catholic, but I've seen these beads. Right, the rosary beads. And I know, there you go. And these rosary beads, you know, they hold each bead and they pray for someone or or send good thoughts or, you know, they that is a type of meditation. So they focus their mind and hopefully good deeds. And, you know, Buddhists do it a different way. There are lots of ways to do it, but when you can learn to be still and to connect with yourself, uh, to open up that channel so that you can, so that you know instinctively what is my intuition and what is my brain thinking? What is the difference there? How do I 
separate them. Well, the only way to identify that is to really get still and learn how to identify it. And that is always beneficial because you know yourself better and you learn to trust in yourself and therefore you trust in the flow of life. So I'm glad you brought up those points because that basically brings us to our next question. Uh, Let's talk about healing and change in a more scientific method. Uh, without having to be bona fide scientists, of course. Uh, You believe by using simple rules of science, the individual has the ability to change their life around. What are the simple rules you believe in? Well, you know, my whole life, um, I, I have always been, it's always been treated psychic phenomena or, you know, what they used to call the sixth sense, and now we identify it as the five clairs or whatever you call it, is woo-woo or just out there. Oh, it's kind of crazy. Oh, it's the crazy lady over there. And the truth is, it is not crazy. It is science. It's vibration. So I explain it like this. I'm a clairvoyant and clairaudient and clairsentient and you know, I hear, see, smell, feel, taste, uh, energy that others do not. Now, you know, for years, people like me have always known that there's an energy that surrounds the body. And, you know, the hippies and the old time, you know, gurus called it the aura. And the aura was, oh, so woo-woo, right? Well, today, guess what? Scientists scan the energy around your head. They do brain scans. They never even have to. It's it's a way to do a brain scan for that your thoughts create impulses that go out into your body and surround your body. And so what I will say to people is that psychic intuition energy, healing, thoughts, this is vibration. It is science. Some of us can see it. Some of us can't. It doesn't mean it's not there. You can't see a radio wave, but it doesn't mean it's not there, right? So it is like that. It is just science. And I think when people stop being afraid of what they cannot see or they don't know. And so now it's got to be some kind of crazy woo-woo thing over here. It's not. It's science. And so how does meditation play into this based on what you said? Well, just like what I was talking about with Carrie's drugs, right? We know through that event, we know scientifically that you can think a particular thought and it can affect your physical body so much so that this young girl was able to run and do a, do a, um, the vault horse and land on a broken ankle, which broke a second time when she fell, but was able to withstand it and do it. Her body couldn't feel it. Just like an athlete who's, who's playing baseball and hits the ball and runs and slides into first and breaks his ankle when he slides into first, but the ball goes past first, and so he's got to go to second. And he gets up and runs to second and has no idea that his ankle is broken and, in fact, doesn't have any idea until he stops and focuses on that broken ankle. And that's when he feels the pain and understands there is something wrong. And so two things there. What we focus on expands. When you meditate and you focus on that inner peace and that stillness, it expands. And we benefit then from that enlightenment that is within that energy or that consciousness. And that is why it's so important and why it is just science. So, you know, there's this guy, I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but his name is Tony Robbins. Uh, And Tony Robbins, yes, Tony Robbins teaches meditation He teaches visualization. He teaches recapitulation, but he doesn't use any of those words. And the reason he doesn't use those words is because he does, he wants to remove the blocks. He understands that people have blocks about, you know, they hear meditation and they think they just discard it. Oh, that's just 
crazy talk. You know, that's a guru at the side of the hill. You know, he's a smart man. He gets it. He knows that if he calls it science and he links it to science, especially men are going to be more apt to try it. I've been at a Tony, uh, Tony Robbins event with 6,000 people. And when you can get 6,000 people to run over hot coals or stick their finger up their nose or do visualizations that bring them weeping to tears on their knees because you never use the word meditation, visualization, or healing, you know, there's a reason for that. It's, it's the brain and what we believe and how we judge things. So let's talk about time, which is something that many people, I'd say a majority of people nowadays, don't believe that they have. Now, I know you may not have a specific answer for this or a very detailed answer for this. So we're just looking for what went an average for average common person that you've experienced. How long would it take for someone who to learn how to properly meditate? How would they go about learning how to meditate also? Well, there's so, okay, first of all, I will say this. There are as many different kinds of meditation as there are people. There are literally thousands of ways to meditate. So go to what you are drawn to. If you want to learn how to use conscious intention or do what I call heart meditation, I have a free video on my website. You can learn it. You can do it. Five minutes a day will change your life. You know, you can learn it in five minutes and if you bring that conscious thought or that intention into the present moment and you align with that energy and then you go about your day and and you know you'll realign with it several times because you'll remember oh i'm not judging today i'm not judging today i, I see it i recognize i have a judging thought i'm going to let it go you can change your life. It will change your life. I've seen it happen over and over and over again. And you hit a key point there that I want to talk about before we let you go. And this is something that I do believe that we both believe is very important to someone's mental, physical, and also their spiritual health. I would like you to provide your insight to conscious intent and how it can be used to shift thought patterns from negative to positive. Oh, it's, you know, it's like the, the most, the easiest, most powerful way you can shift thought pattern. And that is, I, a lot of people don't really understand conscious intent. And it's kind of a, it's kind of a woo woo word. I'm trying to come up with something else for it. But basically, what you're doing is you are setting an intention. And the intention is what that means is, if I am, uh, if I'm a person that I, let's say every day I commute to work and I end up flipping off 10 people on the way because people really piss me off when I'm driving and they cut me off and they're, they just don't care about anything. And I find I'm just tense and angry by the time I get to work. So I want to change that pattern, right? So I use conscious intention in the morning. I sit down. And I take some deep breaths and I relax a little bit. And I, I bring my focus from my head and my thinking, right, in our brain into that, into that spiritual heart center, into that place in the center of my chest. And if you have a hard time doing that, just take your non-dominant hand and tap in the center of your chest and just bring your focus to that place. And allow yourself to breathe in that place for a minute. And then bring your intention in. So my intention would be to respond with love. Today, I'm going to respond with love. And I'm just going to breathe that in for a few moments. And throughout, I, I'm, my intention is for the rest of the day, that is what, that's how I'm going to behave. So now, 15 minutes later, as I'm driving and some stinker cuts me off, and the first thing I do is I yell some horrible swear word, I say, oh, wait, I, I'm responding with love. I take that back. Okay, I'm going to drop back into my heart, and I'm just going to let love come out. 
and I'm going to respond with love. And, you know, for a while, it's a thing where you're, you play catch up, you, you catch yourself in your old habit and your old behavior. But if you stay with it, you let that be your intention all week, you will find that at the end of the week, when the stinker cuts you off, you let them. And you don't scream and yell from your car things that they will never hear. And you feel love. You respond with love. And you just feel a whole lot better when you get to work. I like what you said about the, the tapping of the chest. Because if you, if you tap on your chest, even lightly, it gives out a very low frequency, which is very hypnotic as well. So it, yeah. that's, that's almost perfect for you if you do that constantly to get your, your mind, at least subconsciously, into a meditative state. Yes. You so, know, again, there are so many ways to meditate. Yeah, and that, I think, is one of the easiest ways to, yes. to get yourself to meditate. So, you know, where is the best place for people to reach you at? Um, on my website, nitalipinski.com. Um, you can, they can send me a message. Um, I have n- phone numbers on there. In my book, I have uh, face- my Facebook page information. They can friend me on Facebook or send me a message um, or do it through my website. I'm pretty accessible. So you can find Nita on Facebook.com slash Lipinski or Nita Lipinski. And- um, I th- well, I have two pages. I have my book page which is nitalipinski.com. Yeah. And, you know, I think one is is under bornintuition.com and nitalipinski.com. Let me do a quick check, because if you want to call Nita directly, you can call at 602-448-4703. Once again, that's 602-448-4703, and you can find all of her links on the show notes. Her website directly is Napita, excuse me, Napita, NitaLipinski.com. And Nita, I'd like to thank you for being on the show. It was great. Thank you so much for having me. I enjoyed it. And this is going to do it for this edition. Thank you for listening, and we look forward to having you download us again.